First of all, we say, why robots? Um, I think that part of it is pretty obvious, really. Robots are everywhere now. Um, it seems like every time you open a newspaper, there's some kind of article about robots taking our jobs, or, or Google's made a robot that's you know, on wheels and it's very strong, or there's all these, it's definitely sort of in the air right now. They're increasingly a part of our lives, and we're going to have to figure out how to negotiate that relationship and what that relationship is going to be. So it's a really important issue for us. I also find it really interesting, um, I guess psychologically, because I'm aware that a lot of roboticists um, are really interested in making humanoid robots and even making robots that look exactly like themselves, um, sort of cloning themselves. Um, so it's like this, in this fascination with something that is the other and yet is very much like ourselves. So I think that's one reason why robots are very interesting. Um, and then I guess the next part of the question is, why opera? Well, that might be a slightly uh, less obvious relationship, if you like. Um, I can't say that opera is everywhere, the same way robots are everywhere. 
However, if, if I think about um, particularly contemporary music composers at the moment, it does seem like there's th that opera is in the air. I've just been noticing that people um, writing, making creative works who perhaps five or ten years ago might have referred to them as, oh, this is my installation, or this is my small music theatre piece. Now it's, no, this is my uh, opera for objects. This is my... Um, this is my opera, just because it's got a singer in it. So it seems like in some way opera is really cool at the moment, and we all want to be making, including me, we all want to be writing operas. So it's, it's kind of in the zeitgeist of the contemporary music scene, I would say. Another thing is that opera is a highly stylized medium. So putting a robot into this medium is maybe quite fitting in a way. Robots, as we'll see, they don't, uh, these particular ones you'll see today, they don't really move and talk like us. Um, they're different, and uh, opera singers are also different. They have this different way of expressing themselves. So maybe that's a really interesting uh, thing to look at. Opera does deal with the kind of exaggerated states in some way. Um, and it does, I think, have a, a fascination with the other, with the fantastical as well, with sort of creatures and special beings. Um, so that, that could also be a reason why this relationship will be interesting. Um, but I guess... Uh, uh, a central thing for us is actually the process, as we're discovering as we're working on these operas that we've, we've made for, to show you later on, is that actually the process of making opera um, does allow us to explore a bunch of really interesting uh, issues, not just around uh, the human sort of technology relationship, but in, uh, as to do with performance itself. And so those issues are... Um, uh, sort of what I've centered our research questions around, and they're to do with performance, embodiment, and vocality. So performance, um, if I can just broadly say, it's to do with how do we read an opera? How do we, rather, how do we read a robot on a stage? How does, how does an audience understand? What does that mean? I think we're all used to seeing robots on film and in science fiction and, and, all, of, and all of that, but we're less used to it, uh, arguably, in uh, a theater situation. Um, the next one is embodiment. We do have computers who can write music, who can sing, who can improvise. Um, we have robots who can play percussion instruments and so on. Um, so this question of embodiment, what, what, if a robot is a computer that can move around, what does this ability to move around, what does movement add to the exploration of computer music? That's one uh, area of, of great interest to me. And then the issue of, of vocality, of the voice. Um, there have been robot operas before. And, uh, for example, a very famous one by Todd McIver. The way the robots, who were not humanoid robots, they were really sort of fantastical uh, sculptural shapes that could move around. Um, but they sounded like humans. It seemed that they had recorded human voices and put the human voices into the robots. So I guess my question is, what do the robots sound like when they're sounding like robots? What is it about the robot physicality that would produce a voice? So I think perhaps it's good to go straight into, into Ron's talk now because um, that is the issue. What, what does it mean for a robot to sing? My name's Ron Chrisley and I'm uh, the director of the Center for Cognitive Science here, but also um, I'm from the School of Engineering and Informatics. So I'm, my, my role in the, for instance, the pieces that uh, we'll be performing later today was on the technical side, um, providing the robots and the programming the robots to, um, in effect, carry out the wishes of the uh, composers uh, in, involved. Um, and I really have to thank Evelyn for uh, bringing to my attention this very interesting question of, well, this, this concept of robot opera and the question, what might robot opera be? Um, I guess in one sense, a robot opera could just be an opera, I don't mean to say just, it could be an opera about robots. And um, that notion of robot opera would have strong consilience with the origins of the word robot, which many of you will know, uh, comes from uh, Carol Chapek's play in 1920 um, called Rossum's Universal Robots, or R-U-R. Um, so that's where the word robot was coined for um, robots. And uh, it, even though play, you know, opera and plays are not the same thing, the, the idea that there's a, a dramaturgical aspect at the root of what it is to be a robot, or at least our conception of it, makes the idea of robot opera somehow um, very appropriate. 
And there have been um, robot operas, not just that play, but robot operas staged um, by, written by um, robot researchers. So Luke Steele's staged, uh, wrote and staged the opera Casparo in 2013. Um, and that's an opera about robots, but it involved only human performers. Um, I guess there also could be, given some developments that have already taken place, there could be robot opera in the sense of opera directed by robots. Because a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, um, Antonio Kella, has uh, already designed a robot that was involved in a, and directed a performance um, of a string quartet. Um, he's done that multiple times. The idea here is that the robot uh, will uh, direct the musicians in a way that's dynamically sensitive to their performance and the responses of the audience. So the audience are given those devices, you know, where you can express how you are feeling at the di and uh, in real time, the robot uh, analyzes that data and uses it to say choose the next movement um, or um, or decide on a tempo, etc. So that could be an aspect in the future that you might see. Um, you might have robot opera in that sense. But in uh, my considerations of this question, what could robot opera be? The focus has been on, as Evelyn mentioned, the robot as performing. That is well, in in, a, in an opera, I guess you could have. Um, uh, robots being instrumentalists, or you could have them being singers. So uh, the you know, more essential to the notion of robot opera <laughs> then would seem to be the um, robot as singer, robots singing. Now, there, as Evelyn mentioned, there are robot instrumentalists, um, and yeah, I'm particularly impressed by Shimon, the uh, the robot marimba player that you, that you mentioned. Um, but um, but once you raise this question of robot opera in the sense of robots singing, then the question is, it becomes, um, what would it be for a robot to sing? And that, understanding that question makes you ask the question, and I'm, I'm definitely got my philosophical hat on right now. Um, I have a philosophy background. Um, the, that raises the question, what is singing anyway? What is it to sing? What is it for a human to sing even? Um, now, I don't have a complete, uh, explicit conceptual analysis of what singing is. And I, I certainly would have a lot of homework to do if I wanted to do that properly. For instance, to talk to a lot of singers, professional singers, people who've been trained, people who've thought about this, um, read what phenomenologists have said about singing and what it is. Um, uh, and that, those are activities I look forward to doing in the future. But just based on uh, the thoughts I've had so far and discussions I've had so far, um, I quickly was thought of the question, well, can only humans sing? Is it, is it something that only a human can do? Well, we already use the term sing, singing for birds, right? Bird song is a natural concept for us, natural phenomenon. So that's, if that is um, at all an appropriate use of uh, the word to sing, then maybe we've already um, recognized that it's not only humans that, that can sing. But when we talk about robots singing, then it um, seems essential that the thing that's singing is an artificial agent of some sort, and um, birds won't help us there. Right, so what would it be for an artificial system to sing? Well, here's one way to make progress on this, cons on this question. It's to focus on the cases that are clearly not robot singing. So I think uh, an artificial device merely playing back a recording, that's not singing. Um, so no matter how much the recording, even if it's a recording of a human voice, then it's not, that's not a case of a robot or your CD player singing. So if we've just started playing back some recordings on these robots over here, that wouldn't count for me. Um, I'm, I don't mean to be, um, you know, to legislate and you know, dictate what, what robot singing has to be. I'm, this is more an investigation of what I'm interested in when I'm considering this question, what I think is interesting about the question. So I realize other people might go different ways. And I'm sure somebody could easily come up with some very uh, fascinating and artistically interesting way of mixing recordings and uh, creating some uh, beautiful sounds out of that and uh, having a robot do it in such a way that we might want to call it robot recording. But that's not the kind of, uh, sorry, robot singing. That's not the kind of robot singing I'm interested in. So what, if that's not what I'm interested in, what is it? Well. 
seems that the sound would have to be generated at the time of the performance. So here's why, one reason why performance is important. There has to be a, a designated time that's considered the time of the performance, and during that time is when the sound is being generated, not merely being played back from a previous um, recording. Um, and it, and uh, that, that in itself still wouldn't be enough. So there, you could have synthesizers, uh, vocal synthesizers that are at, in real time generating a vo you know, vocal sounds, maybe even musical sounds, and that still wouldn't be what I'm interested in because it's not really, it's not necessarily a robot doing it. So my, my laptop could, as Evelyn mentioned, my laptop could generate sound in real time or singing uh, sounds in real time, but that's not what I'm interested in. So it has to be that there are motors and effectors, a robot that can actually move and um, uh, engage in different kinds of movement, that would have to be involved and in some sense, yeah, doing the singing. Now, you one could imagine a uh, telepresence performance where there are some, there's some device that has motors and effectors, but it's completely under, it's completely a slave that is driven by a person who is directing what the robot should do and the sounds coming out of the robot are being generated are in real time being uh, a person, and maybe they're processed versions of the, a person's sounds and microphones are being used to transmit uh, signals to the robot, um, if we want to call it that, and the robot's sounds are being created in real time, but entirely dependent upon a human performance. I would not co consider that to be the kind of robot singing I'm interested in. I'm interested in an autonomous performance where the, the robot is not um, under the control of, of any one person directly, you know, Wizard of Oz style. Um, so yes, this, these, I've, the sound that's generated should also be in some sense musical, although I'm very open-minded about what that might mean. And one extra constraint that might not be necessary, but one I am particularly interested in, is um, the constraint that those sounds should, uh, it would be nice if they could also be, or the, the thing generating those sounds could also be the, the kind of thing that could generate speech. So could these sounds also be sounds that carry speech information or carry language. Um, for me, that would, that would um, clinch it that it's a case of singing, um, but again, it might not be necessary for, for it to be singing. Now, I'm, I'm not, uh, I haven't looked at all at the time, so how much time? Oh, yeah, we've got another 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, okay, right. make sure, yeah, make sure you, um, <laughs> you start, no, I'll, I'll keep going all day if you don't stop me, so. Um, so that, where I've arrived right now is roughly what we have in, involved in the performances today. We've got autonomous robot, robots that are generating sounds in real time, sounds that are generated by uh, a system, a functionality that could also be used to generate speech sounds. The sounds that are generated are at least, well, judge for yourselves, but they're at least musical in the sense that the notions of pitch and rhythm can be applied to them. For example, I'm not saying music has to be such that pitch and rhythm apply to it, but um, I think that's, it's sufficient for something to be musical that um, notions of pitch and rhythm can apply. And, uh, and so that's, that's where we are, but I think there's much room for um, development um, that I find very exciting, uh, development of, uh, to make, uh, to further investigate this question of what, a what it might be for a robot to sing. So what directions could, what, what, direct, what further developments could there be that would um, take us more in, you know, further us along the, the road towards uh, robot singing? Well, ideally, the sounds generated would be the result of, would depend on the fact that it's a robot. So with these particular robots, the sounds that are generated are relatively independent of the fact that it is a robot. So the performance aspect of these robots is uh, in their movements, um, their gestures, their embodiment, their presence with us. Um, that, in that sense, yes, their, ro their being robots is essential, but the sounds that they make, um, the particular uh, shape of those sounds, particular textures, I mean, Embodiment structures sound uh, inevitably, but it's rather minimal. The, the effect of their embodiment on those particular sounds is, is rather minimal. So that could be changed. You could have robots, you could, one could develop robots where um, the actual fact that it's a robot that is capable of movement or capable of controlling um, motor processes 
could be instrumental, no pun intended, in uh, generating the musical sounds. Um, and that's an exciting direction that I, uh, I would like to see um, pursued. Along with that comes the idea of well, how, how will this motor process be controlled? And I think it will be important that for these kinds of singing robots to not to just be singers, but to be listeners. So to be able to um, not, well, obviously to perform with others, you want to be able to listen to others and, um, and have your performance, adjust your performance accordingly. But even a solo robot singer should be able to listen to itself as a singer. That is, the robot should be able to, to produce music, should be able to hear music. It should be able to hear sounds as music and have maybe even an aesthetic opinion on whether they're good musical sounds or bad musical sounds. And that ability, it could therefore apply to itself. And that idea of um, being able to listen could affect its control, could affect its own output. If it could realize it's out of tune or hear that this might be a good moment for a little bit more vibrato or something like that. That might be, um, that, that those are applying um, our notions of singing to, you know, in a directly anthropomorphic way to, this ro to these robots, but um, whatever musical uh, dimensions they consider relevant or they discover might, be, um, might guide their uh, own generation of sound. So that was all pretty much with my philosopher's um, hat on. With, um, with, uh, as, a, as a technologist, as a person programming these things, uh, I found uh, this question of robot opera to be uh, very exciting because you've got these um, these philosophical uh, questions, these aesthetic questions uh, that really need to. Um, the, the only way you can attempt to explore them with these robots is to write code and actually try to get this physical technological thing to um, to make various sounds. And the the, the limits of the technology. Um, are quite exciting here, actually, because it forces one to be creative, to say, how can I take this off-the-shelf um, piece of technology that was never intended to be a singing, um, a singer? Uh, uh, how can I, in a way, subvert it? How can I get around the various uh, limitations or assumptions that were built into it in order to um, get it to um, generate sounds and behavior that are more in line with uh, what the composers that I was working with um, had in mind. And that kind of negotiation and uh, the, you know, the toing and froing between ha having one aesthetic goal here, but here's the physical, uh, actual limitation, then maybe we can have a different aesthetic goal here in order to, to make it more physically realizable and make, make um, it more something, something we could reach through um, writing um, the code we have available, and the code possibilities we have. That, that I found very exciting. Um, and then finally, um, just to close off, a wearing, um, what do I say, um, an individual um, who's interested in participating in creation of uh, aesthetic works, you know, uh, dare I say <coughs> artist. As an artist, um, it was, uh, you know, it's, it was exciting to think about the kinds of questions that one can investigate by attempting to participate, you know, well, to, to particip participating in this uh, staging of a robot opera, which uh, involve some of the things that Evelyn mentioned, but um, s some other things too, like um, what's the connection, what can um, this kind of, developing this kind of performance and actually staging this kind of performance, um, what can it tell us about, um, our own relations as humans and as human performers with um, the, the, uh, the desires of the, of the composer. So there's this ancient, well, this very old uh, tension between the uh, individualist uh, specification and goals and notational statement of the composer and the abilities and real-time capacities of the performers. And um, in, to looking at it, looking at that kind of, um, Derek might call it dialectic, um, 
a sh kind of a shadow of that dialectic with the case of these robots is fascinating for me. So you, you might think, well, the robots are just doing what I tell them to do. I write some code and then they just um, do that. Well, I promise you it's not that easy. They don't just do what I tell them to do. Um, otherwise, robotics would be a trivial discipline. It's not a trivial discipline because there's this big question mark between the specified behavior and the actual behavior. And uh, to what extent is that similar to or different from the freedom relation between what the, the composer or director um, or uh, librettist says, this is how it should be, and then the actual performers, human performers, uh, taking that and uh, either attempting to meet it to the finest detail or willfully changing, altering it using their own aesthetic sensibilities or doing both in a collaboration with the, um, the, the composer, director, and, um, and librettist. So uh, I think this is, a, this, this is kind of a, a very in, new, a new point in the space of, that, of the negotiation of, those, uh, of that relationship between the, the ideal, almost platonic specification of the, the work of art and the the, the physical realization. We have one, a, a new way of exploring that relationship and um, that I hope, I, I, f I have found it to um, sometimes movingly um, cast light on uh, the human case um, uh, as well as being uh, of interest in its own right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Evelyn, for organizing this conference, this symposium. It's, it's great to be here, and it's great to see a room full of uh, robot opera aficionados. I wouldn't imagine it would be so many, but it's great. <laughs> um, I will make a, a, a presentation about um, a piece that was, uh, a music theater piece that was presented in um, uh, last February in uh, the Attica Center of Creative Arts. And um, I, will talk about, uh, I will talk about primarily uh, the piece, the process that uh, made me to arrive to that piece, um, uh, the robotic aspect of, of that piece. And then <coughs> I will, I will uh, show more kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the actual process. So my talk is kind of, is gonna have a, a, a kind of demonstration aspect of, uh, of, of the robotic. So <clears throat> the piece I'm talking about is uh, it's called The Magnificent Crossbreeding of Protein and Thin Plate. Um, it was uh, part, it's part of my PhD and um, it was part of my research on uh, uh, posthumanism and generative music theater, interactive music theater and, and so on. Um, the, the, the space that I had to work in this, uh, in this environment was basically, if you know the space of the Attenborough Center, is basically the ground front with all the different kind of small gallery spaces. And I wanted to create an immersive performance where the audience would uh, work through and they would get encountered with different human and non-human performers. Um, the... Uh, the performance was a duration of performance that uh, was going on for four hours, uh, and the audience could come and go as they pleased. Um, and it was, both, it was all based on a certain cybernetic system. Um, it, uh, with in, in that, uh, I mean that um, um, the all different rooms were linked through uh, a computer network. Basically, there were uh, four computers communicate with uh, each other we're using uh, open sound control, um, OSC protocol. Um, and this came from the idea of this notion of, um, of robotic, of robot and robotic from the initial word of the, of the, uh, the, the, of the term robotnik. Basically the word robotic, robot and robotic comes from the Czech word robotnik which means forced labor or slave. Uh, there's a famous uh, revolution that happened in the Hungarian Empire in the 19th century of the Robotniks, where these people basically plebeians fighting against uh, big land uh, uh, 
um, uh, owners. So I just somehow wanted to invert this aspect of kind of the robotic as, you know, um, um, the one of being control and instead of to give the robotic the, the aspect of controlling the whole performance. So I created, a, um, I devised a performance uh, were inspired by notions of robotic as were mentioned previously from, you know, film and, 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 um, and culture like uh, Spike Lee, 2014 Hair, or um, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, where uh, the robotic aspect of uh, the robotic character uh, basically almost takes over or, you know, it's extremely empowered rather than uh, subordinate or, 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 and so on. Um, <clears throat> so the, the system I've created, um, as I mentioned earlier, it was basically a, uh, and uh, a cybernetic network. I mean, the, the, algorithms, the, the algorithms I was using, they were really simple or simplistic in, in terms of, they were all rule-based. Uh, I didn't use any artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine listening, or uh, I don't know, simulation or anything like that. It was basically conditional algorithms that if this happened, then do that. If that happens, then do that, and so on. But um, somehow all these if-then conditional algorithms would kind of create the whole performance and let it involve in many different ways. So what we have here, we have, uh, sorry for the bad graphics, I thought it would be a bit bigger. So we have three different rooms uh, uh, and the corridors. Uh, one room is called uh, Landscape with Argonauts, the second room is called Dispoiled Shore, and the third room is called Medea Material, because all the material I, I, I used to devise this, this work came from uh, Heiner Müller's 1981 play, uh, Dispoiled Shore, Medea Material, Landscape with Argonauts. Um, it was not a one-to-one -one translation of that work, of that text, in terms of a uh, music theater or operatic, but it was um, kind of my means of inspiration and the text that I used to devise the whole piece. So let's talk a bit about the, the, different, um, the different rooms. So in one room, um, one room there was uh, a number of performers receiving uh, generative tasks from the computer. So um, the, the, I, I had a kind of generative algorithm um, uh, controlling a, a, sp a speech-to-text uh, engine, and the w that was giving instructions to the performance. So that you, you could hear from the loudspeaker, so to speak, performer X do task 125. You know, and the performer would go and do task 125. And that would go on until a certain task, uh, until he would receive, they would receive a different task. Um, that's one aspect. The second aspect is um, the generative landscape that again was uh, kind of generating by the computer as well. Um, and parts of the generative as uh, landscape were cues as well for the performance to do certain actions. Um, there was, um, and all that it was made in, in a program called Super Collider. Then, there was a second room, uh, the, the room of Medea, as I call it, um, in which I wanted to, um, to bring this kind of um, robotic entity that controls and devises and arranges and organizes the for performance a bit more in the foreground. So in order to do th that, I thought, okay, the best way to do it, although it's not, a, I don't consider it really this kind of performance as an opera, it's more of a music theater. Um, it has an operatic scale, but it's, it's, it's more, more of a music theater. I wanted this character to have an operatic quality. So for that reason, I used um, uh, a vocaloid, which is basically, um, um, an, an algorithm uh, that is based on concatenative synthesis that kind of, you know, uh, 
generates, okay, can, it, it is used to, to, um, to, to create artificial singing, basically. Basically, you can have a computer singing. Um, I will show you what it is in a second, so it's just an introduction. Um, and again, with kind of um, rule-based algorithms, there was a generative process, so the, the, that um, algorithm was singing kind of generatively. So you had, you were, the moment you were entering in that room, your presence in that room, in that space, would be picked up by a camera, and the whole uh, performance of this vocaloid would go on, and you, had, you would have this kind of artificial opera voice singer singing uh, in the space. Um, the third room, it was a kind of one-to-one -one performance um, between a performer and a member of the audience, but it was always kind of mediated of, from technology. So it was a, a, always an interactive device uh, in one way or another between performer and um, an audience. Um, now, how all these three um, space were linked, as I mentioned earlier, they were linked by OSC. So whenever something was happening here in, in, the, in the room of Medea, this, it would trigger a task somewhere else and vice versa. And um, um, after a certain amount of times that the performer would, uh, would be, um, a member of the audience would pass through uh, and enter in this room, um, then the whole process would stop. Uh, the performance of the landscape with Argonauts would come to the room of the Medea and would pick up the members of the audience and would bring them to the other, uh, to the disposal showroom to have a one-to-one -one act. So I'm, I'm just bringing you basically a, a brief kind of introduction and I'm letting you know how uh, the whole process was, um, was running. So in a certain way, I was not interested in the anthropomorphic uh, aspect of the robotic. Uh, because um, I, 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 I was, I was mm, honestly not interested in into that. I was more interested in the robotic voice, in the anthropophony, if you if you wish, of 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 uh, the robotic. Um, so, um, hence the reason I I used um, these uh, vocaloids. Uh, this is the room where the robotic singing was taking place. It's one of the rooms of, of um, uh, the Attenborough Center of Creative Arts. Um, I forgot to mention that there were two screens that whenever they were picking up presence in that space, they would generate text, part of the text of the original text of uh, uh, Heinrich Müller. Uh, so it will play somehow the role of the um, overtitles or subtitles in, 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 an, opera, in an opera house. Um, but let me do a quick demo. Yeah, the quality of the video is not uh, uh, amazing or whatever happened. Um, <coughs> vocaloids in opera are not something really new. I mean, uh, there is uh, the most famous example is um, Hatsune Miku, who's a very famous Japanese vocaloid with uh, millions of fans uh, online, um, doing a 2013 uh, opera called uh, The End, in, was presented in the Châtelet Opera House in Paris. Uh, by Toshiki Okada. Um, so 
I'm not claiming that I didn't done something new. However, this part, this w w what I did, what is new in this in this kind of context, is was that was everything was kind of generative. It was not fixed media kind of um, uh, thing. So, <coughs> as I promised, let me show you quickly a bit the 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 nuts nuts and bolts of. Uh, of so. Basically, this is a, a, a very simple kind of uh, um, iterative algorithm that sends OSC data to, um, my God, everything has become, um, to uh, a vocaloid called bones, um, which you can put also text and, you know, you can pick of, um, where you can, you can drop basically the, the algorithm from where to start and so on. Um, and you can you know, control um, generatively the vibrato, the, uh, the pitch and so on. Um, also, the, the instruments um, I'm using, sorry, it's are virtual instruments, uh, virtual instruments as well. So there's kind of like um, the, the, the music as well is also generated by the computer. So by triggering this button up here, we will hopefully have some. The algorithm in this case is very simple, almost simplistic. It was just, you know, a kind of a tryout of how of the possibilities. Ob obviously, it can have com completely different kind of aspects, completely different. Now it's kind of a generic kind of legato-like uh, kind of uh, singing. Uh, but I'm very interested in, 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 in uh, I find very beautiful, but my, myself at least, the fact that, um, you know, when it jumps, um, these legato points that, you know, it's almost kind of the voice crackles as if it was a kind of a, a singer's voice crackling, but it's crackling digital, digitally and, you know, it, uh, it arrives in a, in a high pitch, which I find very it's sincere <laughs> in a certain, certain bizarre kind of way. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was the, the operative bit in, in uh, that was the, 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 the robotic, sorry, aspect uh, in that part of the, uh, of the performance. Um, oh, God. Um, so make sure you have your questions. You might want to All right, wrap, wrap up. up. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. cool. Um, uh, this is the generative aspect, the, 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 the algorithm that was dealing with the, um, uh, the tasks for the performers and, and the um, generative soundscape in the different rooms. So, so what I want to talk about today kind of follows on from a bit of what Ron was saying and comes up in the questions after about uh, error and how do we uh, make sure that our robots are, are present within the environment and how, what's the strategies to make sure we can do that in a useful way. So I want to think about some of the kind of fundamental issues in creating interactive robots, interactive machine learning systems, and uh, think about in the making of future operas, how can we create productive uh, or useful interactions between agents, which might be human-machine or might be machine-machine. Uh, my perspective on this, uh, I'd have to be blunt, I don't have much experience of opera, but I do uh, have a lot of experience in creating machine learning systems uh, and using them in performance. 
So building and training machine learning systems. And of course, machine learning is a fundamental part of robotics. So in the way that we train ro robots to have certain behaviors, we can use machine learning to achieve that aim. So that, that's some kind of examples of the kind of controllers I've built before, which have uh, used machine learning either to recognize human gestures or to deal with data that was uh, too complex for humans to kind of intuitively map themselves. So we use a machine learning system to do that instead. So I'm going to make some assumptions here. Uh, one is that we need some sort of real-time interaction between agents in a robotic opera. So we could, we could take an approach where we uh, don't have that, where we script the robots to do what they're going to do, and then we get the humans to work around that script. So that, that's one option. Perhaps that's going to work on a small scale, but if you move up to a kind of large production, that could become problematic. You might get errors that you can't cope with. Uh, we might miss cues. Things might get out of sync. So maybe we need to get the robots to learn, and maybe we need to get the robots to interact between themselves and from human to robot. So how do we do that? So I'm going to make some propositions here, uh, which will become a bit more clear as I talk. But uh, So we can think of a robot opera maybe as a, a real-time interactive dynamical system. So we've got lots of different agents, which might be humans, might be machines, a mixture of. Uh, and they've got to figure out how to adapt to each other and to interact with each other. So we need to do that effectively. Uh, things could get very complex in that respect. So we need to think about complexity. We need to think about how chaos might or might not happen. And we want to stay away from chaos, really. Uh, I'm going to say that agents will be trained to respond to each other within the bounds of some sort of script or composition. So we could do some kind of abstract opera where we let everything emerge, but we're probably going to have some sort of narrative that we want to conform to. Uh, some kind of composition that we've pre-made that we want to realize in the opera. Uh, maybe in this respect, we can view a robot opera as a collaborative instrument where, where agents interactively, uh, expressively interact with each other. And to think of it as an instrument is uh, important in the way that that interaction will be quite nuanced. And that interaction will be something that the performers and robots have to learn together as a skill. So we'll have to learn how to perform with this instrument when all these agents come together. And to create this in instrument, we need to create a shared language between agents. And we have to think about choreography. So how do we present that language to each other in whatever form, abstract form that might take? I'm going to start with a definition. Uh, robots are embodied artificial intelligences. So there are lots of definitions of uh, robots. Uh, this one, I, I wish I could remember who it was. It was on the Radio 4 recently. Uh, but I tried to find the reference and I couldn't. Uh, but this is one that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so we can think of this as, in, a, in contrast maybe to a, a disembodied machine learning or AI process that doesn't have to deal with its environment. So robots have to be present in real time in their environment and cope with changes. Uh, in contrast to, say, a machine learning system that has to recognize faces, it's embodied in environment through a, through a video camera. It might not have to work in real time. It might be able to go off and do things slowly when it's not busy. So, uh, this, so this kind of performative, uh, kind of embodied thing is what we need to think about. So to deconstruct that a bit, a robot, we could say it's inseparable from its environment. So it has a physical design, which is designed to, to be in a certain environment. We might have a robot that's good at swimming, or we might have a robot that's good at walking. Uh, we might have a robot that's good at walking around Mars, for example, that's very specifically designed for that environment. Uh, the way in which it senses that environment is, uh, is determined by the environment. So do we need to know about uh, sunlight? Do we need to know about sound? Of course, an uh, operatic robot's going to need microphones. It's going to need to be able to see, to see people move. And actuating, the way in which we change the environment. Uh, an operatic robot is going to be able to change the environment by making sound by singing and by moving as well, and perhaps by moving other objects as well. Uh, and really importantly, the way in which the robot learns and adapts to its environment is going to be a product of that environment. So how do we train that robot? 
How do we get it to adapt to its environment? So bringing that into opera, so how do we embody a robot within an operatic environment? Because that's essentially what we need to do if we're going to have robots within an opera. A quick thought about the kind of environments we might have within an opera. So we're going to have a rehearsal environment, uh, which might be very different to a performance environment. We might have very different types of behaviours in those two different environments. I'm sure there are other environments, but that's maybe the kind of key ones we can think about. And a, and a slightly tenuous link, we've got some parallels here in machine learning. So within machine learning, uh, the process of teaching a robot or a machine learning process to, to learn a new behavior, we have training and we have a prediction phase. So within training, we'll present, actually I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but we kind of present different examples of behavior to a process, and it tries to learn them. It tries to recreate those. Uh, and prediction, which is more like performance. Uh, so once we've trained a robot, we're going to kind of run it in real time and hope it exhibits the behaviors that we wanted to, it to have. So in training, so we're going to teach a machine learning system to approximate the behavior of some sort of system, so probably some sort of complex system because otherwise we could just kind of do it manually. So it's probably something that's kind of very unintuitive for us to describe using kind of normal rule-based systems. And training, it might be supervised in that we uh, give the robot lots of examples. So if you, if you see this, you should do this. If you see this, you should do something else. We might have hundreds or thousands of millions of those examples. And then we give them all to the robot, and it learns to create the associations between inputs and outcomes. Or we might do it in an unsupervised way in which we present a mass of data to a process and it, through some algorithm, learns to understand the patterns within that data. And then we might fine tune later once it understands those relationships, how it exists within the world. And then after we've trained it, we can, we can move into a prediction process. So we've trained this robot to hopefully exhibit some sort of behavior that we want. And then it's going to observe the world, and it's going to make a guess at what its response should be, given a set of inputs. So that's the kind of generic process that we're working with when we're training machine learning systems. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is show you a video of uh, a machine learning system being trained. It's quite an old video, so it's going to look a bit clunky. It's from 2009 or something. And, uh, but it's just quite a nice, simple example of how we train a machine learning system. It's not a robot, it's a, it's a computer vision system. So what's going on here, uh, this was uh, for an instrument that uh, did hand tracking, and you could kind of draw music. Uh, so there's a video camera, and uh, what it's doing, it's learning, to, uh, it's learning what's a hand and what isn't a hand. And it's doing that by learning skin color. Uh, so that's a bit of a hack. So it doesn't really know, understand anything about hands. We're just teaching it skin color. And once it knows that, it can get rid of the rest of the background. So you can see here, this, this is a video of the training process. Uh, the, your skin color is a, is a combination of the pigment in your skin and the lighting in the room. So for this reason, I'm moving my hands to different points around the desk, which might have slightly different lighting, and it's it's uh, looking at the colors on my hand at those different points, and then it's figuring out what's hand, or what's skin, and what isn't skin. So I just wanted to point a few things out about this video. So first of all, there's a, there's a kind of choreography going on. Uh, so when you get kind of used to train, I'm training this machine learning process, but I'm having to repeat a sequence. Uh, and if I get that sequence wrong, the training's probably going to go wrong, and it's not going to recognize my hand very well. It might kind of, kind of come out blocky or something like that, or it might think the desk is my hand or something like that. So if I, <coughs> if I miss one of those blocks, or maybe if there's a shadow coming in from a, from a curtain on a window, or if maybe a part of the desk is between the, my thumb and my finger, and so if it's getting erroneous information, 
into this training process, it's going to think that's the real information that it should learn. And therefore, it's going to learn incorrectly. So this process is kind of error prone. And it's very dependent on the human which is delivering this training data to, uh, to get this right. So in a way, it's kind of a performance. We've got a choreography here. And there's a kind of shared language that I, need, I and the machine need to, to understand together in order for it to train effectively. You might also note that it's learnt on the top of the hand, and then, but it's actually recognising the bottom of my hand once I turn it round as well. So it's managed to kind of generalise from the skin on the top of my hand to the skin underneath my hand, which, which is actually a little bit of a different colour. So some thoughts about training machine learning processes. Uh, we need to do it so we achieve a good generalization. So a generalization is we give the machine learning process a limited, there's al it's always a finite number of examples, and it needs to learn from those how to cope with any possible input. So, uh, so I can train that uh, process on the top of my hand, for example, and it's generalized to the, to the skin of my hand. So that's a kind of useful thing, but we don't, don't want it to generalize too much because th then it might think the whole desk is my hand or something like that. So it, there's a kind of fine boundary there, and that depends on what information, how much information you present to the algorithm. So there's a kind of a bit of experimentation and a bit of trickery going on to get this to work properly. Uh, during training, we, we develop a, a shared language. So I've got a kind of choreography there of moving my hand around. I've got a choreography of a, a kind of precision of making sure that my hand is in the right place, there's no desk coming through my fingers. Uh, of course, this is quite a simple example, but imagine something more complex where we're trying to get a robot to respond to a human performer, maybe from listening uh, to a, a vocal passage or watching a facial expression. Then we have to be quite precise in how we uh, how we develop that language between the robot and the performer. Uh, so training is a skill here. So we've got some choreography. We have to be precise. Uh, we might think of it as a performance that you have to get right every time. Because if you get it wrong, then you're going to give the, the robot false information, false positives, which it will then think is the truth and learn incorrectly. And you have to be quite good at repetition, so precise repetition. So all of which are skills that a musician will probably have, or an actor, or a, a dancer will probably have. Uh, through a cycle of uh, training a machine learning process, we also have to test. So we present data, uh, and then we see if the training has worked. And by testing, we perform with that system. It's real time. And then we might think, well, I've given it too many examples, or I need to slightly change the variation in examples I've given this system. So we go back and do more training and then do tests through performance again. So by through, this, through the cycle uh, of training and testing a machine, we, we learn to perform with it. So we kind of, it becomes Im implicit in the way we, we deal with it. I'm going to present, uh, so this is the work of uh, Memo Acton who's a new media artist who has got a history of using some really interesting uh, machine learning processes in his work. Uh, this is a piece called Pattern Recognition. And uh, very kindly, he's, uh, he's shared, he uses machine learning as quite a fundamental part of this piece. And he's shared some of the kind of rehearsal uh, videos from this piece, which I think gives some really nice insights into the kind of process that you have to go through if you're creating a performance that involves AI agents. So this piece uh, involves dancers and it involves uh, spotlights, movable spotlights. And the idea is that the dancer, uh, we have a computer vision system uh, following the dancer, and then the lights learn to respond in a kind of generative, generative way, a creative way. So the, there's kind of emergent conversation, I guess, uh, between the dancer and the lights. So that's a kind of 
quite low res video of the, of the actual piece. But let's, let's have a look at the kind of process in the background, which is what I'm kind of more interested in at the moment. So uh, in training this system, so we've got a machine learning system that's uh, observing the dancers and it's, uh, it can control the light. So it's embodied in the world in the way that it can see, it can, uh, and it can control these lights. Uh, in the training, the system watches, so there's going to be two dancers, it's going to watch both dancers and look at how they respond to each other. Uh, so rehearsal and then performance or prediction time. Uh, the system is going to watch one dancer and the lights are going to imagine, uh, imagine how a dancer would respond, so in some kind of generative way. And this is the kind of two minute video from their performance when they're actually training the machine learning system to do this. something like this as well. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. When she was on the side, yeah. We don't need you anymore now that we have your body. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe a, a couple of points about that video. So this is the kind of process that is going to go on now in, a, in any sort of production where we combine machine learning and human performers, that we've got a kind of pre-rehearsal stage in a way that we're training the machines uh, how, to, how to act. But that training process itself is a performance in itself. And, and also, we've got a, this kind of new kind of language that now this dancer here has developed with the algorithm, with the with this system. So you could see he was trying, uh, so the director here was suggesting that he tried something that kind of worked. So they developed this new kind of choreography that's between the two of them. So I'll just leave some final kind of probably wildly speculative thoughts. But uh, so training for performative machine learning system is a skilled and probably error prone process. So we need to think about uh, how we perform in real time to create these interactions. And that itself is, gonna, is quite a skilled thing to do. Uh, we need to think about how you might manage that in some sort of robot opera. Uh, thinking about this complex systems perspective, uh, if you've got multiple agents, and uh, errors can multiply quickly. So we might think about how you might manage that 
either with technology or, or even within the design of the opera itself in the, in the music, in the, in the narrative, how you might limit the potential for things rapidly getting chaotic, if you like. Uh, so training and testing is going to become an important skill in a robot opera uh, and a kind of fundamental part of the rehearsal cycle. And on a wider perspective, thinking about embodiment, so for a robot to become embodied in an opera environment, how much do we actually need to adapt the environment towards the robot? At the moment, uh, I mean, we're making a lot of progress with robotics, but this, we still need to spend a lot of effort to get them to behave in the ways that we want, especially in a kind of complex and arts real-time performance environment. So we need to think about bending things towards them, perhaps, in, in terms of technology, but also in terms of the way we design a production. And uh, that's it.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 